Repo Infinity bailout in the primary dealer credit facility. I'm going to explain all the insanity that's been going on in the markets over the last couple of days in three simple, fast steps. Step number one, let's go over the numbers. And we have got a lot of numbers. I could barely get them onto the board. Now, I want to be clear. These are just the amounts the Fed is committing to. It doesn't necessarily mean they're going to do this amount in repos. It all depends on the demand. But the commitment level is really hard to get your mind around. It's astronomical. Check this out. Just in term repos, what they've committed to when you add all these numbers up is 6.45 trillion dollars and then you look at the overnight repos this week alone i'm talking about today thursday and friday they're committing to one trillion dollars a day in addition to the term repos that they've committed to of 6.45 trillion after friday they said they're going to go back down who knows what will happen to only 175 billion for the next month or ending April 13th for the overnight repos it takes us to 7.2 trillion dollars of commitments when you add that to the term repos we get a total of 13 trillion or 13.65 trillion just insane numbers and I want to point out that's over half the national debt. Like where would they even get this many treasuries? I understand they're doing mortgage backed securities as well, but it's just really, it is truly repo infinity. Going over to the other side of the whiteboard, I want to quickly review how this works. The Fed sets this up with the primary dealers alone. And I'm on Twitter all the time, and I see a lot of you are getting confused on Twitter and in the comments, thinking that the Fed just injects this money right into the stock market or right into the bond market. It's not the way it works. And they don't even go into the normal repo market. These are transactions just with the primary dealers. It's very important you understand that. The Fed goes to the primary dealers, A, B, and C. They give the Fed their collateral, usually treasuries or mortgage-backed securities. Today, I've drawn the Fed's balance sheet a little bit different. I think you can get a better idea of how this works. The Fed pays those primary dealers by putting more reserves into their accounts, which are liabilities on the Fed's balance sheet. And you can think of those as bank accounts the primary dealers have with the Fed. Of course, the treasuries and the mortgage-backed securities go to the asset side of the Fed's balance sheet. So that $13.65 trillion that the Fed committed to, and again, they're not going to do $13.65 trillion, but if they did, the $13.65 trillion would add to the reserve accounts of the primary dealers only. And it would be up to the primary dealers to go into, we'll call it the real repo market or any other market and take those reserves and turn them into deposits. So then they're actually injected into the system. My point is, if the primary dealers don't do anything with the reserves and they just sit at the Fed, it would be like you taking that $13.65 trillion and just stuffing it under your mattress. It, it, just, it literally wouldn't matter. It just adds reserves to the system. And they don't need more reserves right now. They need those reserves to get out into the system and bail out all of these hedge funds, financial institutions, and who knows who else will go bankrupt over the next couple of months. But more on that in step number two. Step number two, the bailout and the plunge protection team scam. It 
all starts with the PDCF, Primary Dealer Credit Facility. To dive into the details further, let's go right to the Fed's term sheet. First and foremost, I want to point out the Fed only works with the primary dealer banks. A lot of reasons for this, but I would guess one of them is most likely because they can control these banks a lot better with their transactions on a day-to-day -day basis, but that's just total speculation. Where it gets really interesting is when we look at the collateral. They can not only take the treasuries and mortgage-backed securities they take in repo, but they also can take investment-grade corporate debt, international agency securities, commercial paper, municipal securities, mortgage-backed, of course, we talked about that, asset-backed securities, plus equities. In other words, stocks. And notice this bullet point. Additional collateral may become eligible at a later date upon further analysis. So if the CEO has a collection of baseball cards, as an example, or an old 67 Corvette in his garage, well, hell, the Fed will take that too. It just never ends. It's just whatever they want to throw up, the Fed will give them money for instantly, most likely 100 cents on the dollar. The term 90 days, but I'm sure they're going to be able to roll that over. Rate, basically zero. So you may be asking yourself, okay, well, what's the loan size? The loans will only be limited to the amount of collateral pledged by the dealer. So however much you got, we'll go ahead and take it. Trillions, quadrillions, it just doesn't matter. Then when we get to the end of the document, this is what's really shocking. How long will the program last? The PDCF will remain available to primary dealers for at least six months or longer if conditions warrant. So this is basically an open-ended bailout or potentially a way for the Fed to buy stocks and corporate bonds. There's two things that could be happening. First and foremost, Peter Schiff thinks this is a bailout for the primary dealers, per his Twitter feed. And if you're not following Peter on Twitter, make sure you do that right now. I had an interview with him yesterday, and I promised him <laughs> that I would help promote his Twitter feed. So follow Peter on Twitter right now. But per his Twitter feed yesterday, he said he thinks this is a bailout for the primary dealers. How would that work? Let's assume the primary dealer's balance sheet right now has stocks, corporate bonds, and treasuries on the asset side. On the liability side, deposits, debt, equity. We all know that the market has tanked over the last 30 days, and interest rates in the corporate bond market are going through the roof. That means the value of those corporate bonds are going down. So in their second balance sheet, their stocks have gone down in value and the corporate bonds have done the same. I highlighted them in red to illustrate this. The Fed goes to the primary dealers and says, listen, just like repo, we'll take these assets off your balance sheet and we'll put them onto our balance sheet, and then we'll just give you the reserves. I'm assuming at 100 cents on the dollar as of 30 days ago. So the primary dealers aren't going to have to absorb the loss that they would have otherwise taken if they would have sold those assets into the open market. Let's use an example that makes this really easy to understand. If you go out and buy a house for $100,000 and you take out a mortgage for $100,000 to buy that home, your balance sheet has a $100,000 home on the asset side. On the liability side, a $100,000 mortgage. Let's assume that house goes down in value by 50%. So now it's only worth $50,000. The Fed comes to you and says, hey, boy, we're really sorry about your bad luck there. What we'll do 
is we'll take that house off your balance sheet and we'll give you a hundred thousand dollars what you paid for the home so instead of having negative equity you're made whole this is exactly what they're doing with the primary dealers to peter's point so if you look at the third balance sheet instead of having all this garbage that isn't worth much including the treasuries now they have brand new reserves to replace those garbage assets that match up with the liability side of their balance sheet. They're made whole, just like you were made whole by the Fed buying your house at 100 cents on the dollar. And let's not forget, the primary dealers and banks under the Fed's umbrella already had 1.5 trillion in excess reserves prior to this most recent collapse and the PDCF, the primary dealer credit facility, opening up. So if they have even more <laughs> excess reserves now, what's to stop them from going into the stock market, buying stocks, going into the corporate bond market, and buying new corporate bonds just to prop those markets up? Those assets go onto the balance sheet of the primary dealers. The Fed buys them from the primary dealers, and I know they're calling it a loan, but who knows what will happen. So they take those assets off the balance sheet of the primary dealers, the assets they just bought 30 seconds ago, and they put that money into their reserve accounts. This allows the primary dealers to buy as many stocks and corporate bonds as they see fit. It is truly the plunge protection team. Step number three, end game questions. Usually I conclude with an end game where I connect all the dots for you. Right now, the data is changing so quickly. There's so many different variables that it's hard to know exactly how this is going to play out or even venture a guess. So the best thing we can do is ask ourselves the right questions. And it starts with how big is the Fed's balance sheet going to be when we're done with this crisis and we come out the other side. When we started the last crisis in 2007, 2008, Fed's balance sheet around 800 billion. It got up to 4.5 trillion. Now we're over 4 trillion. So what's the next step? Where is it in three months, six months? Does it go to 10 trillion, 15 trillion, 20 trillion dollars? There are some very smart people on Twitter five days ago saying the Fed's balance sheet could exceed 10 trillion dollars. I think today they would take that and notch it up quite a few levels now that they've introduced the $1 trillion a day repo and this bailout scam with the primary dealer credit facility. It starts with government deficits, and it's not just about the limitless bailouts they're going to be doing over the next few months or the fiscal stimulus packages. It's also about interest rates. The Fed has to keep interest rates low along the entire yield curve or else the government isn't going to be able to afford to issue new bonds and roll over the existing debt. This is something that nobody is talking about. And the people that build the models at the Fed, they only assume interest rates go down in a recession. But what happens if interest rates go up? And Peter Schiff makes a great point regarding this in the 1970s in my full-length interview with him. That'll be uploaded this Saturday, so let's go to a clip to check it out. When the Federal Reserve does these stress, stress tests, I think they're engineered so that all the banks pass. I mean, they're not really putting them through the type of stress that they need. I mean, one of the uh, circumstances that they've never tested was what happens if there's a recession, but interest rates go up. They, that's never one of their assumptions. They always assume that if there is a recession, interest rates will always go down. Well, what if they go up? What if long-term rates go up? Uh, no bank can withstand that. We have stagflation, and that's where we're headed. I think that there's gonna be a currency crisis. The reason that the dollar didn't collapse 
in 2008 because of QE1 and 2 and, and, and all the tarps and the, um, you know, the, the various bailouts was because everybody believed it was a one-off thing. It was temporary and that the Fed could unwind the balance sheet, normalize interest rates. But none of that ever happened. And now the balance sheet is blowing through the roof. It's going to be much bigger than it ever was before. Uh, they're back down at zero, just like I said they would for years. And now no one is going to believe that they can ever normalize rates. I mean, they couldn't do it last time. How are they going to do this this time? Especially that they, since we have so much more debt now, the more debt you have, the harder it is to normalize rates. Um, it's like, you know, the more drugs you take, the harder it is to kick the habit, right? So if we get a stagflation type scenario where interest rates want to go up naturally, the market is pushing them up, but the Fed has to counter that by buying those bonds and pegging the yield curve, just like they did in World War II, where does that take their balance sheet? It goes way north of $10 trillion. And let's talk about social unrest. It's really not part of the mainstream narrative right now, but think about this. If the federal government comes in with all these bailouts, we're gonna see something like Occupy Wall Street times 100. People are gonna be pissed and they are gonna take their pitchforks to the street. So in my opinion, the buybacks on a moving forward basis may be banned. And if they don't ban the buybacks, I think they're going to limit them some way with a new type of Dodd-Frank type bill. But you've got to remember, the buybacks contributed to almost 95% of the stock market gains since 2010. So if we limit or ban those buybacks, and I'm not saying we should, I'm just saying that if we do that, how will the stock market recover? How do people's 401ks recover? They don't. That's my point. So the next question becomes, how much will the Federal Reserve have to buy in stocks and corporate bonds to make sure that people's 401ks aren't half of what they were 30 days ago on a moving forward basis, or that the pension funds haven't completely blown up with all of the corporate bonds they own. That's a completely separate video. I've done that many times. But the bottom line is the Fed is gonna have to come in and prop up these markets. And how do they do that? By printing money. That expands their balance sheet even further. So now you have these two cross currents or really tailwinds to their balance sheet. Number one, they've got to peg the yield curve. And if interest rates want to go up, if market forces are pushing them up, they're gonna to have to print trillions of dollars to keep that yield curve low to where the federal government can issue more bonds, pay for all of these programs, and they can roll over their existing debt without going bust. So then you add that to the fact that they're gonna to have to buy stocks, buy corporate bonds. I see this going well north of even $20 trillion. The last question becomes, how long will this last? If you watch last night's video with Dr. Chris Martinson, and I strongly, strongly suggest you do so if you haven't already, you read that report or you saw his analysis of that report saying this is all about herd immunity. And even if we're able to cap this in the United States and across the world, it still leaves us in a very vulnerable position going into the fall where we don't have enough people that have built up that immunity by getting the cervasa sickness in the first place. So the takeaway is that we might not be done with this until we get a vaccine. How long will that take? Most likely a year to 18 months. So think about this. If the Fed has to maintain these operations for a year or 18 months, does it go to 20? Maybe it even goes to $30 trillion. And that's not a prediction. I'm just saying that as a thought experiment, if all these circumstances play out, we could very well see that. So lastly, if it goes up to 20 trillion, $30 trillion, if what they're doing creates deposits in the real economy, that's where we might see inflation. I'm gonna to touch on that more on Friday's video 
But as a teaser, let's go into that and see how it would play out. The Fed prints all the funny money, puts it into the reserve accounts for the primary dealers. We discussed this in step number two. That creates the new reserves on their balance sheet. Right now, it's not in the system. But if the Fed has to buy stocks and corporate bonds, they buy those stocks and corporate bonds from the hedge funds and the financial institutions and retail investors. That's a big, big deal because it takes the money printing from the Fed's balance sheet and creates new reserves in the system. The hedge funds, financial institutions, and retail investors take the money, they deposit it into their retail banks. So on the left, we have the old deposits. That's how many deposits were in the system prior to the Fed buying all the stocks, bonds, through the primary dealers. When they get done with that, we'll have a lot more new deposits in the system than we had before. What basically happens is the reserves, the funny money the Fed prints gets from their balance sheet into the retail banking sector. That's where we have a lot more currency or money supply potentially chasing the same amount of goods and services, if not less, due to the supply chain constrictions we may see with the Cerveza sickness. So the question now you should be asking yourself is, will we experience inflation? It's a very complicated question. And like I said, we'll touch on that in Friday's video. For more content that'll help you build wealth and thrive in a world of out of control central banks and big governments. Check out this playlist right here and I will see you on the next video.